Okay, so we're going to continue from yesterday when we were talking about uh, memory solutions. Thanks a lot. Uh, memory uh, trends, opportunities, and challenges. And I wanted to finish this part first, uh, give some broad strokes in terms of the solution ideas, and then talk about the row hammer problem. Does that sound like a good plan? I think row hammer problem can actually take an entire lecture, but we'll see how much we can cover. I wanted to give you these broad strokes first. Basically, hopefully you have a good idea of why memory is a big problem today. Uh, now the key question is how do you solve the big problem? I think you'll see a lot of approaches uh, during the course of this course. Uh, but I think this is one slide that I like using. First of all, we, we probably want to fix the problem. There are multiple directions, I think. Fixing it meaning uh, from the perspective of memory and controller is becoming more intelligent. I think I'm motivating this a little bit more uh, as, we, as we discuss hybrid memory, for example, as we discuss scaling issues. You'll see this a lot more in this lecture. Basically, this means uh, we want to design new interfaces, new functions, and new architectures uh, in memory so that we can do more stuff in memory. Today, we just uh, can access memory, uh, move and store data. But maybe if we design the system and the memory together, memory can become more intelligent. So we'll, we'll, we'll definitely follow the solution and talk about it uh, a little bit more. But the second solution direction is also interesting, which is eliminating or minimizing the problem. If you can somehow get rid of the technology that is having problems and replace it with hopefully a better technology, this could be very useful. Now, as you remember from yesterday, there's no technology that's good at every single metric that we want. So that's the difficulty over here. The difficulty is maybe there's no single technology that will satisfy all of our uh, metrics. And I believe that's true. That's why we need this part as well. But this is still good to pursue because uh, exploring these new technologies can lead to some new kind of rethinking about how we manage data in the memory hierarchy. For example, if you have something like phase change memory that's non-volatile and your programs can directly access non-volatile data and manipulate persistent data, that's a very different model compared to going through the file system I.O. Uh, calls so that you can manipulate persistent data. You can immediately write to an array and that becomes persistent. Right? You don't need to go through a file system and write the array, convert it into something, serialize it uh, to make sure it's persistent. You're writing some, somewhere immediately and it becomes persistent. And that way you can operate uh, nicely without a lot of overhead. So this is also very important, I think. But again, keep this in mind. I don't think this is a solution by itself. It's part of the solution. I think all of these are part of the solution, actually. And the third one is, I think, also interesting. I will briefly talk about that before uh, we finish with this part of the lecture. Maybe we should design heterogeneous memories, none of which are perfect, and map data intelligently across them. So clearly, memory is not easy to get perfect. There are a lot of reliability issues that you will run into when you scale the memory technology to smaller technology nodes. Uh, like the refresh problem, like the row hammer problem, which I briefly mentioned and we will delve into today. But maybe it's okay to have those problems in a good chunk of your memory as long as your data can tolerate those problems. Right? That's the idea. For example, if you have uh, some uh, uh, machine learning weights that are stored in memory and you can tolerate some small errors in those weights or in the input data, then maybe it's okay because the algorithms are statistical anyway and they can tolerate the additional error that comes from uh, the fact that memory is not perfect. There's some bit error rate that's in memory that has just, more, just some more noise that the algorithm is already tolerant of. That's one example, right? In fact, a lot of the machine learning applications can tolerate a lot of errors. Uh, we may talk about that later on uh, as the course progresses. This is true for, uh, actually, an easier example is probably video. If you're displaying something on a video and if it, with one pixel or two pixels go wrong, you don't notice the difference, right? Which means that uh, some amount, of, as long as your bit error rate is low enough such that only one or two pixels or a non-noticeable uh, number of pixels go wrong, Maybe it's okay to store things in memory that is not very reliable. Right? That's the idea. So if you can do this, you can actually get potentially a lot of benefits. So this is actually, I think, also a good direction to explore. But I think all of these directions need to be explored concurrently. And maybe there are some other directions. If you come up with some other directions, let me know. Anybody has some idea at this point? Okay, maybe during the course you will come up with something else. So far, no one has come up with something else when I presented this slide. But this doesn't mean that you cannot come up with something else.
But I think uh, this is one thing I would like to emphasize. All of these solutions require cross-layer thinking. Uh, like many other uh, issues we have in computer architecture today, if you want to achieve energy efficiency, you need to think cross-layer. If you want to enable memory scaling and solve the memory problem, you also need cross-layer thinking, software, hardware, device cooperation. And you will see examples of this. You've seen examples of this uh, with Refresh, for example. We brainstormed a lot of ideas where software, hardware, devices can cooperate uh, 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 across the stack. You will see more of this as we go forward. So keep this in mind. If you can solve the problem at one layer and get rid of the problem, that's great, of course. But a lot of the solutions are not going to be that easy going forward. Okay, so keep this picture in mind also. Basically, the solutions will span across the stack. So let me talk about these three solution directions very quickly uh, and then finish this part of the lecture. Basically, the first solution direction is new memory architectures or fixing the problem, coming up with uh, new memory architectures that are uh, basically architectures that are more memory centric as opposed to compute-centric. Uh, this means we'd like to examine the interfaces, put more functions into memory, like some computation inside the memory could help a lot of applications. Today we cannot compute inside the memory. We'll talk a lot about that going forward. Uh, better waste management I think is also important. It turns out a lot of the memory is wasted today. There's a lot of studies that show that uh, in main memory, 30% of, of your main memory, for example, stores zeros. It's amazing. 30% of your memory is zeros and you're storing zeros. Maybe you're not even accessing them much of the time. So how do you actually get rid of that sort of waste? And this is just capacity waste. There's also bandwidth waste. There's latency waste. There's energy waste. For example, refresh is a big energy waste, like we've discussed, right? You could get rid of a lot of the refreshes if you do the right thing, if you do a design intelligent memory controller. So think about it from a waste perspective. Perspective. If you actually, uh, if your goal is extreme efficiency, ideally you would get rid of every single waste that you have in the system. And capacity is one example. Then people have been looking at compression techniques in memory. These are actually employed in some real products. IBM has in their Power 8 system uh, compression in their main memory so that uh, uh, they actually store data in a compressed form and whenever they need to bring the data into the processor they uncompress it. Actually they uncompress it I think in the L3 cache. Okay, so there are a bunch of key issues to tackle in designing a new memory architecture. I think I've listed pretty much all of them, at least all the interesting ones over here. Well, I, this doesn't have security, of course, but I think it's implicit somewhere here. Uh, but basically, we want to enable reliability at low cost, because that is what really needs to uh, high capacity. We want to reduce energy as much as possible. We want to reduce latency as much as possible, improve bandwidth, reduce all sorts of waste. Uh, I think these are interesting, because if you want to enable reliability, uh, uh, sometimes the trade-off you make is increasing energy. For example, you have retention failures, you keep refreshing, right? Uh, in order to enable reliability, you're expanding energy by refreshing. So these two things are actually uh, somewhat oppo opposed to each other. If you want to enable reliability, you usually expand more energy. Air error correcting code is another example where you expand more energy. And they could also lead to performance problems as well. So it's good to keep in mind that this is a complex trade-off space over here. But I think this last one, enable computation close to data, can help a lot of these at the same time. And this computation is not just computation for application, but also computation for the management functions. For example, if you have a good memory controller that can, uh, that, that can uh, understand which parts of memory are, can be accessed with low latency, which parts of memory require high access latency, you can reduce the latencies by discovering which parts of memory can be accessed with low latency versus high latency. We'll talk about that. Because of large variation, uh, in the type uh, in the DRAM uh, or in the memory cells, some cells need longer latency to access because they're not so good, let's say. But some cells can be accessed very fast because they have a lot of charge in them. We will discuss this idea. So it's very similar ideas to refresh, and this require intelli requires intelligent memory controllers. I think of that com memory controllers that can compute. Uh, and they need to compute in a sense, right? Profiling is some sort of computation. You basically keep track of things. But you can, of course, extend this idea such that you can offload applications uh, to the memory and the applications can do computation inside the memory. Of course, if you want to do all of that, you need different new interfaces, right, uh, to memory. You have to be able to talk to memory in some way other than what we're doing right now, read-write. Today, we're just doing read-write, right? Okay, so there are a lot of very, very interesting and ideas over here to explore, I think, and we're just beginning to explore them. Uh, that's the nice part. So if you have a lot of good ideas, you can have a lot of impact 
uh, on how the, how the systems in the future are designed. And remember, this is memory in general. So that remember that wafer scale chip, most of that is memory also. So computation is important, but memory is a lot more important in existing systems. So we're going to talk about a lot of works over here. Just to give you an example that this is a very rich area, uh, this slide lists all of the papers that I think of that we've written in the area. This is just our papers. There are, of course, other groups that are working in the area also. And I, I think at some point the font size that I uh, need to use will become too small to fit over here. But, but I, I haven't reached that point yet. So. So the, actually, if you look over here, the first paper is the Raider paper that we started with. When we first started doing this research, we thought the refresh was the big problem. And I think it's still a big problem, of course. And we, you already know the Raider paper, and you're reading it. Okay, somewhere over here, there's a color change, which I cannot detect when I look at my screen, but I can detect it when it's on a screen like this. Interesting. Somehow I mis messed up the color. Okay, so human eye is clearly... Uh, uh, not perfect also. <laughs> Meaning, you can display another color over here and I don't care, right? <laughs> so you can see that a lot, of the, uh, a lot of data doesn't need to be perfect, potentially. Okay, so the second solution direction is uh, I think designing new memory architecture is really independent of the technology. DRAM is a good technology, but you can do it in any technology, right? But I think looking at some emerging memory technologies that are not uh, dominant yet is also very important. There are some emerging memory technologies that are more scalable than DRAM. I'll talk about one very briefly and then we'll talk a lot more about it later on. Uh, these technologies are resistive, meaning they store data in terms of the resistance value that's stored in some device. And they're also non-volatile. So one example which we've talked about earlier is phase change memory. This is, uh, there's some material uh, called phase change material. Chalcogonide glass is one example that's very commonly used. Uh, and you store data by changing the phase of this material. And you read data by detecting the material's resistance. So a material exists in two states, amorphous and crystalline, and these two have very different resistance properties, high resistance versus low resistance, and there's a huge range between the resistance values that you get in amorphous state and crystalline state. And as I mentioned, uh, people have devised read devices that can read uh, the resistance value very reliably from these memories. We'll talk more about that later on. And you can see the numbers over here. Yesterday we discussed ITRS in 2009 was projecting that DRAM will not be easy to scale to uh, lower than 35 nanometer technology nodes. At the same time they wrote that report, in the same report actually, they said phase change memories expect to scale to much lower nanometers, as you can see, 9 nanometers. And today actually the projections are even lower. I believe maybe they're on 3 or 2 nanometers. These are really small numbers, as, if you can imagine, right? Uh, so this is a very scalable technology. Uh, and we'll talk about that later on. And this is uh, actually, if you're really interested in the technology, this is a very nice paper written by IBM Journal of, in IBM Journal of Research and Development by IBM researchers who are developing this technology. This is an old paper, it was written in 2008. Uh, and they, al they also prototyped a chip at, at 20 nanometers as early as 2008, as you can see over here. Uh, so it's actually, uh, this is real, uh, and there's a lot of research that needs to be done to make it really beneficial to the system. And this expect to be denser than DRAM for other reasons as well, not just because it's, scale it's more scalable, but you can also uh, divide up the resistance range into finer granularities. You don't just say, uh, if, if you have high resistance, I have zero. If I have low resistance, I have one. That's one encoding. You chop it up into four intervals and say, if I have this resistance range, I have zero, zero. If I have this one, I have zero, one. If I have this one, I have one, zero. If I have this one, I have one, one. Now you can store two bits in a single cell by chopping up that resistance range into four. You can store three bits by chopping it up into eight. And you can store four bits. I, I haven't seen any four bits yet, but I think people are examining three bit PCM. You can store four bits if by chopping it up into 16. So there are issues related to it, but you could do it in this technology much more easily than you could do it in DRAM, because DRAM is very much charge-based and charges very much subject to a lot of electrical interference, a lot of electrical noise, whereas resistance is less so. Unless you chop it out to very, very fine grain levels. Okay, so this is, I think, fascinating. Flash memory does something like this also, which we will talk about when we get to flash. Now, of course, this sounds great, right? And actually, now it's, uh, it's produced also. There's a memory module that you can buy, uh, 3DX point, that has some sort of phase change memory. Uh, but the problem is emerging memory technologies like phase change memory have many shortcomings as well. 
uh, for example, their latencies are longer compared to the ARM, their energy is long, uh, higher, the access energy is higher. Not the they don't have the refresh problem, at least not to the extent the ARM has, so refresh energy is lower, static energy is lower, but the access energy is higher. And they have an endurance problem usually. Not all technologies do, but PCM does, for example, it has an endurance problem. Whenever you write to uh, a, a memory cell, you degrade the contact as a result. At some point, you cannot do read or write to that cell. So in, in, in the presence of these shortcomings, the key question is, can we somehow enable these technologies to replace DRAM? If not replace, maybe augment DRAM. Uh, if, because with hybrid memory technologies, you can have DRAM plus phase change memory. And maybe there are cases where this can surpass DRAM, right? Especially if you take advantage of the non-volatility here. If you can take advantage of the non-volatility, you can expose uh, persistent memory directly to the applications. And now, you write the persistent data directly to uh, this non-volatile memory chip as opposed to going through DRAM and you having to write that back to the SSD. That's the idea. So it's possible to surpass as well in, 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 in different use cases. So this is certainly a fascinating direction and uh, certainly we're, we've been working in this area and these are some of the works that uh, we have done in this area. So we'll cover some of them, we'll also cover some of the other works uh, that have been, that have, uh, that's being done in this area. But this is also a very active area of research as you can see. Like this, uh, this paper I mentioned earlier, this is one of the first three papers that uh, proposed phase change memory as a way of scaling the DRAM system going into the future. It was published in 2009 and now we're in 2019 and we do have uh, a persistent memory module that we can buy and uh, play with, let's say, in a real system. But this doesn't mean that there, uh, there shouldn't be more research in the area. There's a lot more to be done in this area to enable these technologies. And it's not just phase change memory also. There are other technologies like STTM RAM, resistive RAM, and memristors. Those are also interesting. They all have different properties. Phase change memory, uh, in, in 2009, we thought that that was the best one to get into the market relatively quickly. And uh, I'm not sure if that's true, but at least we have an... Uh, uh, a proof of existence that 3 dx point is out there and you can buy it and other technologies I don't think uh, at least you can buy I don't think you can buy at the same capacity levels for example you can also buy STTM RAM uh, from one company that's producing STTM RAM but the capacity that you have in STTM RAM is not very high today whereas phase change memory I think is a lot more scalable at this point okay anyway uh, so this is, I think, a more viable direction going forward, given that technology, uh, no technology exists that's good at every single metric, and you've seen this picture before. So these, this sort of hybrid memory systems is uh, the other direction, uh, the next direction to examine, and we're going to talk about this as well. So basically in this course we're going to talk a lot about DRAM, a lot about emerging memory technologies, hybrid memories, this is at least in the first part of the course. Does that sound good? Okay. And whenever we're talking about this, talk, uh, think about the opportunities and ideas at all at the at cross layer, right? Across the stack. For example, if you have hybrid memory, um, and if you uh, uh, you may want to think about algorithms to manage it as well. And those algorithms may be employed at the very high levels, right? How do you design your algorithm to take advantage of these technologies, assuming these technologies are exposed to you? That's that, that's an area where there's some work, but not a lot of work. But if this technology is there, I think people need to think about that going forward. Okay, so let me give you one example of this hybrid memory. And this kind of merges the hybrid memory with the, with the embracing it, embracing the unreliability part. So if you look at applications, if you understand the properties of the data, you will find that not all data is, uh, is vulnerable at the same level to uh, memory errors or bit errors. So if you get a bit error uh, in some uh, data structure, Sometimes uh, you get, you, your system crashes, or you get some unreasonable result. Right? Clearly that data is very vulnerable. It could be a pointer uh, that you messed up, and then once you mess up that pointer, you uh, dereference a location where you get a segmentation fault. Right? That's certainly possible. So that data is very vulnerable to bit errors, but there's some other data that's not very vulnerable. It could be the least significant bits of a weight that you use to train your network, and at that point, it doesn't matter because you have a lot of statistical tolerance. It could be one of the pixels, right? Especially if, the, if it's the least significant bits. So clearly, some of your data is very vulnerable. Some of your data is very uh, not so vulnerable. If you can classify your data somehow, the question is who does it? Let's assume that the programmer somehow has an idea. Uh, you can take advantage of this information by designing a hybrid memory system 
that is different in terms of how it treats that data. For example, the tolerant data, error tolerant data can go to low cost memory, uh, which could be not so protected, let's say. You don't even uh, correct the errors, but maybe you, uh, you detect the errors at a coarse grain somehow. Uh, and maybe the chips are less tested. So because you, can, you know that you can tolerate the errors, you don't test these chips as much, which means that you reduce the cost as much as possible because testing actually occupies, uh, is responsible for a lot of the cost of chips today. Uh, but if you know that this chip is going to be used for tolerant data, maybe you design it such that it has some reasonably tolerable bit error rate. Right? Whereas if you know that this other chip is going to be used for uh, vulnerable data, maybe you, you over-design it a little bit, you make it very protected, you make it very well tested, you, you employ the best solution that you have in all sorts of reliability techniques. Right? Now, uh, if you have this sort of heterogeneous reliability memory, and if you know your properties of the data, at least uh, uh, black and white in this case, but of course you can imagine shades of gray in between as well. And you can imagine different types of memory that map to the shades of gray. This is just a concept that looks at the black and white part of it. Uh, then you can design an overall system that can potentially become uh, more scalable. right? Because for example, if most of your data is tolerant, you can keep adding more low-cost memory to your system. And ideally you would like to have a small amount of data that needs to be uh, protected really well. And you can keep that memory relatively small. Now your overall uh, memory could be very large and capacity could be very large, very scalable, and your cost will be relatively low still, right? Because you're really taking advantage of the properties of the data. I think going forward, this sort of techniques is, uh, this, uh, this sort of technique is going to be very important. Again, this is very cross-layer, right? Programmer needs to specify this. Actually, I didn't ask the question who needs to do this, but programmer, uh, when we did this work actually, uh, which was published in DSN, uh, uh, programmer, my, 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 my PhD student was the one who decided which one's vulnerable and which was not vulnerable. And I'll give you some results based on that. Uh, but of course you can imagine identifying this uh, in some other way, although it's not very easy, I think, because uh, there's a lot of semantic information that needs to be uh, processed to understand what's vulnerable terrors and what's not vulnerable terrors. Okay. So uh, I'll give you one example, but take this with a grain of salt because this is really a case study. When we were looking at this, uh, we were working with Microsoft and we wanted to understand. Uh, so if you look at uh, very large data centers, uh, what people do is they protect uh, their memory with error correcting codes uh, because they don't know what will happen. So they actually protect all of the memory with error correcting codes. And most of the time, error correcting codes don't produce errors. Remember when I talked about yesterday, uh, talked yesterday uh, I said that uh, more than 80% of the errors are produced by uh, less than about 20% of the servers. Which means that a lot of the servers are relatively reliable in terms of the memory. So most of the time you don't really need uh, error correction in memory. But of course you don't want to risk <laughs> your chances, that's why everybody protects their memory with error correcting codes. We wanted to understand can we get rid of those error correcting codes as much as possible because it costs a lot of waste in the system in the end, performance waste and power waste also. And if you actually have this sort of identification, we found out that you can get rid of, uh, this memory needs to be well protected, but this memory doesn't need to be as well protected, so you can actually reduce the server hardware cost significantly. 4.7% may sound relatively low, but it's really not that low, it's, it actually uh, you, you should multiply this with all of the servers that you have in the system. And uh, while, 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 you can, uh, while doing that, you can still achieve a single server availability target that's pretty high uh, because clearly you will get some errors in this uh, uh, region and sometimes you need to service those errors. Uh, but you, know, you don't need to do that on the critical path. The key is identifying the data correctly so that vulnerable data does not go over here. That's the idea. Okay, so I'd recommend reading this paper. I haven't assigned it. We'll, we'll, we may talk about it later on. But uh, let me give you the cross-layer approach of this. Basically, you have, imagine you're running in a cloud, and these were, this was our target, basically. You have a data center system where you have a lot of applications that are sent to you, and you're running these things. So somehow, how do you, how do you actually uh, map the data from these applications uh, to uh, different uh, memories? So. Clearly this paper explored part of the design space. There's a lot more to be done in this area. So the first step is really characterizing and classifying application memory error tolerance. You can do it in the, so there are multiple ways of doing it. Uh, who does it, first of all? I think programmer is a good place to do it. Maybe compiler ha uh, can play some role, I'm not sure. There's, a lot, there's not a lot of research in this area, that's why I'm talking about it also actually. Uh, and 
once you characterize that, uh, what is the granularity at which you characterize it? Like, do you do it at coarse grain? Do you do it at very fine grain data structure level? Or do you do it at one gigabyte memory level, let's say? In this paper, we looked at it as a, at a, uh, as a different memory region level. So we didn't go into the very fine grain data structure level. Uh, once you have that information, uh, also, what do you classify? Do you classify it vulnerable and tolerant? Or do you look at shades of gray as well? Right, that's the key question. Like, what are what are the different tolerances? Do you, how do you specify it? Do you specify it in terms of bit error rate? Maybe this data can tolerate a bit error rate of some amount, right? So there are th these sort of questions actually affect the interface that you have also because you need to communicate this. Of course, classifying is vulnerable and tolerant is a single bit, so that's easy. That's why we opted for it. But you could imagine making this much more extensive and specifying bit error rates for each data structure. And also, if you do it at the data structure level, you, have, you run into some other issues, like how do you convey that information at the data structure level, level to here? Right? Because now you need to have a lot more information, a lot more metadata associated with each data structure. If your granularity is coarse, your metadata usually becomes smaller. So this is a very fundamental trade-off again. If you want to specify something at a finer grain, you need to have more metadata. If you want to specify something at a coarse grain, you need to have less metadata. Of course, if you do it at a finer grain, you have more control over the system because you can do the mapping at a much more finer grain and you can adapt to the data structure. If you do it at a coarse grain, maybe you put many, many things uh, together and treat them the same, right? even though they don't necessarily need to be treated the same. Of course, in this case, if any of them is vulnerable that you put together, uh, it needs to be treated as vulnerable. Right? Okay, so the next step is mapping application data, data to the heterogeneous reliability memory system uh, through hardware software cooperative solutions. Those are discussed in the paper. But of course, what is this heterogeneous memory system? There's also a, a design free, uh, a degree of freedom over here. You can see that there's a spectrum of reliability versus, uh, to unreliability, right? What is unreliable? What is reliable? Clearly, you can, you can have very strong error correction codes on the, this end of the spectrum, and you can have no checking at this end of the spectrum, right? You basically give the memory, it has a lot of errors, and tell the programmer good luck. Probably not a good idea. <laughs> but, I mean, this design space uh, is, is, is good to explore. So you can see how rich even a single topic like this is. Uh, it spans all the way from applications, maybe even algorithms over there, to system software where you do the uh, mapping and also language support where you need to actually uh, classify these things and underneath the hardware design that you need to do. Okay, so this is one example of a study that we have done, for example, uh, in the web search application. We looked at web search graph processing uh, in this work. Web search is much more amenable to this sort of thing. Graph processing is a little bit less amenable. Maybe you need to go into a more data structure level, finer grain level. Uh, because graph processing has a lot of pointers that you need to actually deal with. You don't want to mess up any of those pointers because you can see some of the metrics that we looked at. This is, uh, this is the cost savings. Ideally, we would like to maximize server hardware cost savings. We'd like to maximize also. We'd like to maximize a single server availability. We'd like to minimize crashes per server per month. Clearly, you have some crashes per server per month, even in existing systems. You don't want to increase that by much. If you would like to also minimize the incorrect queries out of some number of queries, right? Incorrect query uh, results. And I don't want to go through this in detail, but uh, I like the sort of graph that looks at what a typical server looks like. That's the blue one over here. Consumer PC is actually much less reliable. Uh, uh, yeah, inner is actually worse. I should tell you that. Outer is better. <laughs> Basically, that's why consumer PC is much less reliable. Uh, you can see that it's in the inner part of this graph. Uh, heterogeneous reliability memory is closer to a typical server, as you can see, but its savings is much better. It's, it's lower cost. Uh, if I can find that, where is that? Oh, that's the HRML. We should be looking at the red part over here. You can see that it's uh, ultra is better, so its cost savings is much better. But its reliability is a little bit less uh, compared to a typical server. So this is a trade-off between reliability and cost in this case. Now, of course, the question is, how do you actually make this better? But I'll, I'll leave that to you for now. Any questions? So this is an area where you can actually uh, have a lot of impact by uh, taking advantage of heterogeneity in the system and mapping the heterogeneity in the application's reliability behavior to the heterogeneity in the hardware that you design. Yes? So with the HRM, you have to use, uh, you have to go to the software 
Is that also something you have to do with phase change memory, or can you have like the interface handle all of that? Uh, when you have DRAM versus phase change memory, right? Yeah, no. it's, it's a very different like. That's right. It's a different kind of hybrid, right? Uh, heterogeneity. So uh, in phase change memory, uh, I think it, it depends on the approach that's taken. But you could, all, uh, in phase change memory, because uh, you're not really messing with the reliability, let's say, you could do a lot of this in the underneath. So uh, maybe the application programmer is unaware of this. Okay. And you will, we will see some mechanisms that basically put the functionality in the memory controller. A memory controller decides what data needs to go to DRAM, what data needs to go to phase change memory. Yeah, so but here, uh, yeah, go ahead. Uh, so, uh, so right now, like, software is not one of the challenges for phase change memory. So yes and no, <laughs> in the sense that uh, if you want to use phase change memory, uh, uh, as a DRAM replacement or DRAM augmenter without taking advantage of the persistence property, then, then the answer uh, can be yes. Soft software doesn't necessarily need to be involved over there. But if you really want to take advantage of the persistence, then the software needs to be rewritten to, uh, to say, okay, these parts of my program need to be in phase change memory and they need to be kept, kept persistent. So we'll talk about some of those issues related to persistence later on. Because persistence is also another property of uh, data that's semantic, right? That's, that's very, very hard to infer uh, uh, automatically. Just like uh, uh, vulnerability to errors. Any other questions? These are very good questions. Feel free to ask questions. Questioning is the first step to actually improve anything. <laughs> Okay, okay. I, I, I spent more time than I wanted to actually in this paper, but I, I think this is a very good direction going into the future. And you will see later, uh, so I, I think of these as, uh, uh, when I give uh, talks uh, about our computer architecture, uh, I emphasize three things uh, in some of my talks. Like one is we want to be more data centric. Uh, that's hopefully clear, memory centric, uh, more intelligent in memory. We want to be data driven meaning that architectures need to take advantage of the data that's presented to them. If you have lots of data, you learn from that data. And we want to be more data aware. And I think this is an example of the data aware approach. Basically, we're aware of the properties of the data. We convey those properties of the data to the underlying system and architecture, software and hardware layers. And the underlying layers exploit that property of the data in a way uh, with some, with some, to optimize some metric. In this case, it's cost, but you could optimize other metrics also. And I also think of this optimizing uh, scalability as well. Okay, so we'll talk more about these data aware architectures. This is just one example. Another way of being data aware, for example, is uh, understanding. Uh, uh, so, uh, actually, if you look at a neural network, uh, not all parts of the neural network is vulnerable, uh, equally vulnerable to errors also. If you understand, for example, this particular layer of the network is more vulnerable versus this particular layer of the network is much. Uh, less vulnerable. Now I can map these, map the data of these layers to different sort of memories like this. That's an idea. So it's very so uh, the same idea applies to different applications as well. In fact, we have some work coming up in Micro uh, this year uh, that uh, identifies which layer is more vulnerable uh, uh, to errors, which layer is less vulnerable to errors, and basically maps the uh, vulnerable layers to those memory locations uh, or memory parts. Uh, where you reduce the voltage and the latency so that those parts of the uh, memory are much more efficient but they have some more errors but the good thing is these layers that can tolerate those errors are mapped to those parts of memory that have some errors but at the same time you, you're improving the efficiency as well as the performance of the network so that's the idea so it's a very similar idea it's also you're, you're, you're also being da data aware when you're doing the mapping of the network to memory location. You can exploit this also in, in your accelerator design. You can design parts of your accelerator to uh, have more errors but much more efficient. And you can design part of your accelerator to be very reliable, no errors but probably less efficient, and take advantage of the properties of the network such that the network that require the network parts that require reliability uh, are executed in the reliable parts. Network require the uh, network uh, layers that don't require as much reliability are executed in the uh, parts uh, that don't provide that much reliability. That's really a way of thinking, I think. And I believe there's a lot more to be done in this area. Because there, there are many other properties of data uh, that we can exploit. Okay, 
So let's see. Uh, I'm going slowly. <laughs> any any other thoughts? But that's okay, I think. Uh, okay, if you have good discussion, that's good. So this is something I'm going to rush through relatively quickly because we've already discussed the quality of service problem. Basically, this is an orthogonal issue. Uh, so uh, we talk about three different solutions, right, to memory scaling. Uh, you employ any of those solutions, you still need to solve this problem. Right? This memory interference problem is something completely orthogonal. As long as memory is a shared medium, you, you will have this problem. And pretty much in everything, memory is a shared medium. <laughs> That's interesting. You design a specialized accelerator. This is actually very, how, how interesting things are. Things evolve this way. You design a specialized accelerator. You think it's going to be used just, one for, just for one application. One generation, it's used for, for just your application. Let's say your pedestrian detection accelerator, right? You put it in your uh, car. The, full, the sole function is pedestrian detection. Initially, you use it for that. Next generation, you improve it. You use it for pedestrian detection. Next generation, you start thinking, well, I have all these 200 accelerators in my car. Why don't I start consolidating things? So now your accelerator becomes bigger. It's not just doing pedestrian detection, but it's also doing braking. OK? <laughs> and then you decide, OK, well, I still have 100 accelerators. Uh, let me actually put some more. Now you're doing pedestrian detection, braking, and I don't know, whatever else detection that you're doing. There's so many detections that you need to do, right? You need to have eyes all over the place if you're designing a self-driving car. Basically, that's how industry evolves. You, you basically start consolidating things for uh, not only performance reasons, uh, well, uh, not only efficiency reasons, but, some, uh, but also, uh, well, I guess utilization is an efficiency reason. Uh, but you find out that your accelerator is not used most of the time. <laughs> So you actually want to consolidate more things in an accelerator. And once you start consolidating things, now you're running multiple tasks and you, ha you run into this problem. That's why this problem is so fundamental. <laughs> okay, and the solution is really designing quality of service aware memory system, and we will talk about that. Basically, you somehow need to design the hardware to ensure that you get fairness across different applications, some sort of performance isolation guarantees. And there are many techniques that we will discuss uh, that aid into it, basically doing the memory scheduling in a task-aware or application-aware manner, memory partitioning, and memory throttling. We will talk about these in more detail in, in the coming lectures. And of course, this is again a hardware-software cooperative problem because you can do fairness in hardware, and as long as the software, uh, if, if the software doesn't care about fairness, maybe that's not important, right? Maybe software doesn't care about fairness. Maybe software wants really performance guarantees for this application at this moment, right? It really doesn't want fairness at that moment. So you really need a substrate that can be programmed at the software layer so that the software can actually have its goal satisfied. So it's not, it's, it cannot be rigid in a sense. So that's why you, it cannot, this is it's an example of where as a hardware architect, what you design over here critically affects what the software can do. If you bake in a policy that's rigid, that cannot be controlled by the software, then the result will be that no one runs multiple applications on your computer. Right? So you're back to square one. You put in all this hardware support for fairness and no one is using it. It's not useful in cases where you really need to uh, satisfy some deadlines. As a result, you're back to square one. Actually, you're, you're worse off because you've added some more hardware that's becoming useless. Right? Okay, so that's why you need to really keep into account what the software's goal, goals could be. And I, I think in, in many cases, the software goals is I need to detect this thing uh, by, by a deadline so that I can take action, right? And of course, that deadline is determined by how fast you can react, for example, how, fa how fast you can push the brakes given the distance between uh, this car and this pedestrian or this bicycle or whatever is coming uh, in front of you, right? So it's really, a, uh, in the end, it's, it's very much similar to a real-time system uh, that you need to design. And if you're consolidating multiple applications, you need to really guarantee uh, the, per, uh, the, the real-time deadline requirements. Okay, but the key is basically designing these quality of service memory, memory systems uh, to provide predictable performance and higher efficiency. So let me give you, uh, uh, basically I think as I mentioned just now, uh, strong memory service guarantee is a good idea uh, because you really want to satisfy some deadlines, but of course it's not easy because you want to satisfy some performance or service level agreement requirements. Perf uh, so service level agreement applies to the cloud, but you can think of deadlines in a uh, self-driving car is a service level agreement, right? Clearly you have a service level agreement that you're not going to uh, drive over somebody, <laughs> hopefully. <laughs> so that agreement you have to satisfy, that requirement you have to satisfy. Uh, 
but you need to do it uh, in the presence of all of these complicated things. So one approach, which we will cover later on, is somehow develop rigorous techniques and models that can accurately estimate the performance loss or slowdown of an application in the pay, uh, or, uh, or a task in the presence of resource sharing. When you're sharing resources with some other tasks, you have some slowdown. You, know, you identify that dynamically through some online techniques. Now you have the information that you're, you're lagging behind by this much. Right? Now you can use this information to do the prioritization and partitioning the hardware mechanism. So for example, if, the, if you figure out that this application is lagging behind by 2x in terms of the latency, then you start prioritizing it because it can, it can lag on, only as much as 1.8x so as, the, as described by the service level agreement. So of course, you need to do the calculations to decide whether, what is one point. Uh, how, how do you? Uh, what, what is the slowdown that you can tolerate? Right, and that goes back to uh, ensuring that you don't hit the pedestrian, for example. So that's the idea over here. If you can uh, do do this, you can develop accurate models to estimate slowdown. You can drive the hardware mechanisms for fairness and quality of service uh, to do the appropriate prioritization, such that you achieve the required performance level for all tasks or al all applications. Of course, you should do this, and while, uh, while, while the goal is ma maximizing the system utilization at the same time, right? Because there's a reason why people are consolidating this, these things on the same accelerator, for example. If this is not the goal, then th the solution is really easy. You just run, run one application on a huge accelerator, and the application occupies only 5% of the accelerator, and everything else gets wasted. Okay, that's why high performance is still important. Okay, we'll talk about some of these works. These are more general purpose domain works, but the, uh, the, the ideas are very much applicable to accelerators that are really shared across different tasks. And I think there needs to be more work on understanding how these things transfer to the accelerators themselves. Okay, any questions? Today you're, you're more silent than usual. Maybe I didn't give you opportunity to ask a lot of questions. Yes? I'm wondering if maybe this last thing can be used to dynamically Yeah, yeah, that's a, that's a very good idea, actually. Basically, you're you're suggesting solving the problem at a uh, more runtime system scheduling level and identifying which applications go well together yeah. versus which applications don't go well together, and put the applications that go well together uh, in the same chip. Yeah, exactly. And though that's a that's a very good idea. So something like that is employed in distributed resource management systems and data centers, like VMware has distributed resource management mechanisms that try to put the applications that go well together on the same node. But again, there's, there needs to be more research done in that area also. But that's a, that's a very good idea, I think. So what is the downside? <laughs> well, again, some time is wasted on maybe calculating, maybe we need to mm -hmm. know that at the start, of course. We need to do some actually calculations and... Exactly, there's some overhead the associated with it, yes. For changing the one, moving one process from one rate exactly. to the other also takes time, yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. There, if you if you made the wrong decision, then you actually <laughs> make, can make the system worse. But yes, I think that's uh, in general. If you do the right things, that's a good idea. And that works if there's heterogeneity in the application behavior. Of course, if you need heterogeneous tasks, if all tasks are exactly the same and they're badly interfering with each other, you cannot do much. You're you're basically counting on the hope that you have a lot of heterogeneous tasks that you can schedule from and you can pick and choose. Are being added to our existing process, and mm. maybe there is a, a solid chance that they are going to be different enough. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, exactly. And, and, and you, we, we see that actually in many applications. The applications are very heterogeneous behavior, as you will see during the course of this course. And also, even within an application, you can have different phases uh, that are completely different. So you could do this at an even finer grain. Even within, within an application, you can determine how it's doing at that point in time and schedule it. Okay, what else? Some good ideas. Is it a bit dark today? It feels a bit dark for me. 
today I'm feeling a bit weird maybe. That's, uh, there's something in my head that makes it dark. <laughs> okay. <coughs> okay. Mm. Okay, so I don't really want to cover DRAM controllers. Uh, basically, this is more like a personal uh, uh, history in DRAM controllers. What I would like to say that DRAM controllers, memory controllers, actually there should be more memory controllers in general. Memory controllers are going to be more important. Uh, actually, when I first started looking into memory controllers, uh, I was doing my PhD. That was my first summer uh, uh, as, a, as an intern uh, doing my PhD. And I'm proud of this patent that we filed. Uh, I was doing it at Intel. And we were looking at actually, at that time, uh, at that time the memory controller actually was off chip, meaning you had the CPU and you had the bus controller, front side bus controller, and then there was a separate memory controller on some other chip to uh, control memory. Later what happened was, this is another area that's interesting, AMD put the memory controller on the processor chip and they showed that you can reduce latency significantly and then Intel put the memory controller on the processor chip they also showed that you can reduce the latency significantly this is an example where you start integrating a lot more of the system controllers uh, on a single chip and we were actually looking at memory scheduling as early as my initial parts of my PhD yeah, I didn't continue uh, uh, with this I looked at tolerating memory latencies but uh, I like looking at this patent once in a while and you can see that it's filed in many many places I guess <laughs> I don't know if anyone has violated it, but it's not my problem, it's Intel's problem. <laughs> okay, so this is, uh, we will talk a lot about memory controls in this course, and we've already talked about memory performance attacks, so keep that in mind, but there are also solutions to this problem, so we actually looked at solutions. Uh, again, I'm not going to go through this right now, this is just to show you that uh, this quality of service problem is a good reason to make the memory controllers intelligent also. In fact, quality of service is all about intelligence, I think. And that's exactly why, uh, from my perspective, I started thinking, if you have this sort of intelligence that you want to add to the memory controllers to provide quality of service to different applications, why not do more? Why not put more intelligence to actually execute applications inside the memory controller? Right? So I think all of the uh, things that we're going to discuss, at least in the initial parts, are going to point to the same thing. You want intelligent controllers, and that intelligence is beneficial for many, many reasons. That could help you scale, as we will talk about in the row hammer, that could get rid of refreshes, that could get rid of a lot of latency, that could help you provide quality of service, that could help you execute applications. But this is my uh, like personal history in a sense. I recently presented it at the ISCA conference, going through these papers. Uh, this is actually interesting. This is a review that we received from ISCA. This is a nice, these were some of the nice times when people wrote nice reviews. <laughs> you can, so you can see that this, this is sometimes hard to get in reviews. People are a bit stingy these days. Uh, you can see how this paper touches these topics and suggests a superior approach to current known techniques. Okay, uh, anyway, <laughs> so we'll, we'll joke about reviews sometimes also. <laughs> Okay, so I'm not going to cover these clearly, but there's, there's a lot of wealth of research that still needs to be done. So this is, for example, you can see that it, things are becoming stronger and stronger, even by looking at the titles. Uh, for example, this is a scheduler that looks at high performance, fairness, and low cost at the same time. Multiple different metrics. So that you really need to look at multiple different metrics going into the future. This looks at scalability as well, uh, and looks at heterogeneous systems. This looks at deadlines, how do you actually satisfy deadlines when you have hardware accelerators. This is very similar to uh, a system that you should use in a self-driving car, for example. You really have lots of hardware accelerators, you have a central CPU, you have a GPU, and you need to satisfy the deadlines coming from all of them. Remember that Tesla chip that we discussed, the two chips, it, consists, it essentially has this sort of setup. It's an SOC in the end. That's true for here also, actually. I mean, it's, it's nothing different. Maybe, maybe a self-driving car makes more life-critical decisions, right? Okay, and this looks at more strong service guarantees and develops models for application slowdown. So basically, my takeaway, I think, is memory controllers are really critical to research, and they will become even more important going into the future. So there, there's no research that, can, uh, there, there's no one that can say there, there doesn't need to be more research in this area. <laughs> if somebody says that, you can counter that relatively easily, I think. Because it's really at the center of the world in a, in a system like this. And also a self-driving car, I think. Okay, you've seen this picture. Uh, basically, uh, we, we have comp uh, lots of heterogeneous co uh, complex systems over here. We have heterogeneous memories coming over here. And memory control is at the center of arbitrating all of those. And if you have intelligence over here, it will also execute applications. And basically, you need to satisfy a lot of demands. And so there are many goals, many constraints, and many metrics that you really need to optimize for. I think this is really fascinating. It's really good to develop good insight and good intuition as to how you would design 
uh, these controllers over here because in the end I think those will become processors uh, and much more important than the processors themselves probably uh, so this is something that we will later talk about but I think if you have a system that as complex as this uh, so much information uh, maybe it's good to also think about uh, designing the architectures to be more data driven data driven in the sense that it takes into uh, takes all that information that learns over time what is a good scheduling policy uh, that you need to follow and this is our initial at attempt we did this as uh, one of the early works uh, that we've done while I was at Microsoft Research it was published in 2008 as you can see it looks at memory control as a reinforcement learning agent and design it so designs it so I think this sort of uh, designing controllers or designing policies and architecture such that the arc uh, policies themselves are driven by machine learning is very important going into the future because systems are becoming very complex if you look, if you look at this as a human, and if you try this, as, uh, try to design this as a human, you will come up with some policy, but the policy you come up with will be looking at very simple metrics in general. As a human, you cannot consider, let's say, a thousand different metrics, right, in the system. As a human, you cannot look into the future really well. As if, even if you understand the system really well, you don't know these complex interactions that are going to happen, right? And that was our motivation to design the memory control as a machine learning agent. And reinforcement learning happened to be a very good uh, learning technique that maps to uh, the behavior of the memory controller because you could prove things theoretically uh, because you could show that memory control is a Markov decision process when it's doing the scheduling decisions. But we'll talk about that later on. So this is, this is just a foreshadow. Uh, so I talked about the data aware aspect of our computer architecture, but this is really the data driven aspect. In a sense, we have all these controllers all across the system. Memory controllers is center of the world, but you have other controllers, cache controllers, SSD controllers. You have decisions that you make in the instruction scheduler. You have decisions that you make in the thread schedulers. You have decisions that you make in the memory allocator. All of these have complex interactions. And thinking about ways of designing them in a data-driven manner such that they're machine learning agents that can learn and adapt uh, over time, I think that's a very good way of designing. For example, I mean, we talked about FRFCFS policy, right? First ready, first come, first serve. It's not a terrible policy, but it's looking at only two things. Whether the robot is a hit, uh, and what is the age of the request. That's only two things. You can look at many, many things. This control is looking at many, many things, actually. And also, it's not thinking the future, right? It's always doing FRFCFS. It's not really, uh, it's not really learning from its actions. In a sense, it's a very bad way of designing an intelligent system, right? If we want really intelligent architectures to drive everything that we're doing, we really want our systems to be intelligent also. So, uh, my, my memory controller over here is doing FRFCFS since the dawn of its life. It sounds a bit sad, right? It's seen, I don't know, five years actually, this is a bit old. I think maybe four years. It's seen four years of information passing through it. And it's still doing row hit first, oldest first. If you think about it from this perspective, it sounds almost stupid, right? Why is it doing just the same thing? Why isn't it learning from what has happened even five minutes ago? Let alone five minutes, a minute ago. Let alone a minute, a second ago, right? It's not learning in the end. It's a very rigid policy. And I think having this mindset of changing the entire system such that it learns from its actions, I think it's a very good mindset. And this paper is a very early example of that mindset. And I encourage people to think about that mindset because there's a lot of things that you can do if you start thinking about the system that way of course this requires a good understanding of computer architecture as well as machine learning which are two hot areas so we, uh, I think computer architecture and machine learning can interact in different ways this is one way of interaction how do you improve architecture with machine learning and the other interaction is how do you improve machine learning with architecture right those are the accelerators that people are building right now this is an area that will become even more important down the road Okay, so basically there are many new problems in memory controllers, and I think machine learning has a good uh, place, uh, uh, a good role to play. And I think machine learning is also a part of intelligence. Actually, once you put a machine learning agent over there, hopefully it's fundamentally more intelligent. Right? It's learning from its past, past actions. Okay, so before I, we take a break, uh, this is what I intend to cover in the next few lectures. But this is a static schedule. Never believe a static schedule. I, I very much believe in dynamic systems. Dynamic schedules are always better because static schedule is something that you uh, design without knowing the information dynamically, right, in the future. 
So, so this is a very good example is compiler schedules instructions in some way, but compiler doesn't know whether you will get a cache miss in this particular load. Right? So if it didn't anticipate that cache miss, it would schedule the instructions, assuming that the next instruction is dependent uh, on that load and you get a stall. So as a result, people have figured out that dynamically scheduled architectures, out of order architectures that change the order of execution of instructions internally are much higher performance. So we will do that also in the lecture. <laughs> Even though this is a static schedule, this is an intention of what we will cover, but we will reorder things based on like dynamic things that will happen. Uh, I'm, I'm, uh, I usually adapt my lectures such that I decide, okay, this is a good topic to cover at this point in time, because today is 2019, last year was 2018. We're not in the same situation, right? Okay. Uh, and also there are local <laughs> concerns as well. So basically we'll talk about Rohammer and then we'll talk about all of these things in maybe this order, in memory computation, low latency memory, and we will talk about the data driven and data aware architectures a little bit more. And we will uh, hopefully uh, at least wrap up this part of the course with uh, guide, guiding principles and conclusion and we'll move to some other part of the course. Does that sound good? Okay. I, will, uh, I, I haven't assigned this paper, but uh, this is actually a paper that I really like. Uh, this, was, this was probably the earliest position paper that I have written. I was invited to give this talk at this International Memory Workshop uh, in 2013. Uh, and uh, they asked me to write a paper also associated with the talk. And I wrote this five-page paper uh, on memory scaling. And I talked about memory scaling also. Uh, it's a very nice workshop, actually. I was there last year. No, this year. This year, giving a, a tutorial on in-memory computation also, they invited me again. But this is actually, uh, I like this paper a lot, maybe we will assign it, but this covers a lot of the memory scaling aspects that we will talk about. But you can see that it is 2013. And while, while I was writing this paper, we didn't have evidence as to these memory scaling issues. Samsung and Intel didn't have their paper, we, didn't write, we hadn't written our Rohammer paper. So uh, I had to actually look forward <laughs> as an architect. <laughs> But I like going back to this paper because I think uh, a lot of things that we've written are very interesting over there. So some of the things that we have covered in this paper is these challenges in the EM scaling. Refresh I talked about, latency, bank conflicts, parallelism, we're going to talk about that a lot. Reliability and vulnerability, that's what we're going to start with uh, because that's really important. Uh, I mean, everything is important, but this is really, really important, as we will see. Energy and power. And memory is inability to do more than store data. Uh, uh, basically, it cannot do more than storing data, right? Or accessing data. This is phrased in a weird way, but <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's what it means. <laughs> basically, we want to change that. We want to ma make memory more able, in a sense. And uh, I will probably assign this also, but this is a more retrospective that we've written. I've shown this yesterday, but we're going to cover Rohammer next. That's why I wanted to end with this one. So when I was writing the paper in 2013, uh, we didn't have this evidence. Now we have overwhelming evidence that memory scaling is a huge problem in the field. Because if it wasn't a problem, this wouldn't be out there. Okay, so this sounds like a good, good time to take a break. What do you think?